I remember back when I was a young doctor in training. Uh, I was doing the night shift, and I remember how I was woken up in the middle of the night, an alarm going off, and feeling slightly panicked. A nurse coming into me and saying, "Magnus, you need to see this patient." And you know that panic. I need to stay sharp, but my brain was just feeling like fog. And I'm sure you've felt that when you've been woken up in the middle of the night. And those of you who have had young babies, do you remember that extreme tiredness as you were woken up every other hour for several nights in a row? You just couldn't recharge. You couldn't get that energy you needed just to do your normal activities the next day. Well, now imagine that you have that brain fog, you have that extreme tiredness, and it never gets better. It actually gets worse for every year that passes. That is a typical life of a patient with mitochondrial disease. Mitochondria, you heard them being uh, introduced earlier today. Mitochondria are these tiny parts in all your bodies that creates your energy, the energy you need to stay awake here in the afternoon. But also to do physical activities. I mean, all your organs to function need energy. So maybe you remember back when you were kids. Did you ever compete with your best friends, like running up that hill, see who can come, come fastest up to the top? Do you then remember how suddenly your legs felt really heavy, burning feeling? Well, that's when your mitochondria have reached the like the limit of their energy capacity. They can't go much further. Well, if you have mitochondrial disease, you have genetic mutations that impair that energy generation. So you cannot run up that hill. You may even struggle just to get up from from your chair. This is Regina. She has mitochondrial disease. When she got her genetic diagnosis, she got an explanation for why she wasn't able to keep up with her friends when she was growing up. And when she uh, got children of her own, three daughters and one son, she, she tells us that she was really exhausted just by preparing their breakfast and sending them off to school. So she had to get back to bed to try to recharge. So that tiredness and that muscle weakness that these patients typically have, that's very common in mitochondrial disease. And the quality of life is severely impaired. There's no treatment out there. So quality of life, actually her, this is passed down from mother to children, and her three daughters have decided that they will not get children of their own. They will not bring new life into this world when the quality of life is so poor. So we'll now imagine, can, can we do something about that? Can we develop a medicine? Can they take a pill just to increase that energy enough to get through the day, to bring some hope for tomorrow? So essentially, what, what is our focus is to increase the energy, to recharge those batteries. So how do we do that? Well, what is the opposite of mitochondrial disease? One example, a uh, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was this guy. And he clearly had too many mitochondria, or it was called mitochloridians in Star Wars. Those of you who are Star Wars fans, you know that if you have a lot of mitochloridians, the force is strong in you. And you can use that for good, or you can use it for bad. Um, in real life, if you have too few mitochondria, or if your mitochondria don't function sufficiently, you get mitochondrial disease. So what we are doing with our portfolio of new compounds is to take the situation where we have a poorly functioning mitochondria to try to improve their energy generation and also stimulate the buildup of new mitochondria. So we do that with a portfolio of first-in-class therapy, so there are new molecules, new mechanisms of action that has actually created quite a lot of excitement in the field. Because as I said, there is nothing out there, and our mechanisms of actions has been specifically designed to treat mitochondrial disease. 
Our lead compound, KL1333, is in late stage clinical development. It's actually in the last stage before we can go to market approval. So, as you know, when we develop drugs, we need to do clinical trials. And especially when we are in late stage, we want to test our compounds, to test if they're truly efficacious on something that matters to patients. And for our patient group, what we heard from Regina and other patients is that fatigue and the muscle weakness, they're not only the two most common symptoms, they're also the two symptoms that are really debilitating and impacts the quality of life the most. So we've decided to focus on those, and that has really resonated both with the regulatory authorities as well as payers. They want to pay for something that really matters to the patients. So we had an opportunity to evaluate KL1333 early on. So we had a phase 1b trial. And you can see some examples of the data we got from that trial. So to the right, we tested fatigue, and we saw promising signals of efficacy reduced fatigue. And in the middle, we also tested a muscle function, and similarly, we saw an improvement in muscle function. And last to the right, we tested on biomarkers, which has also been discussed today. And we saw a clear reduction of biomarkers consistent with our mechanism of action. So, confirmation of target engagement. So, when we look here, we have a late-stage asset that has really been de-risked. So, we have checked the important boxes. We have ensured market exclusivity, compound matter patents, also supplemented with orphan drug designation. We have validated that we can have premium pricing for our target product profile. We've done payer interviews in the US and Europe, which are our major markets. We have really exciting science based on three decades of, of our work, and it has been validated with the phase 1b data you saw. And we have the team to deliver that science. That includes team members who've taken other rare disease access to the market, including team members from Caliditas, which is a recent Swedish success story. We have secured manufacturing, and very importantly, we have the regulators aligned with our development pathway to market. And I think the most important milestone in the company, in this program so far, was achieved this summer. We had an interim analysis, which is like a halfway test in this ongoing pivotal program. So pivotal means that the authorities have agreed that this is the trial that will decide if we can get market approval for KL1333 or not. That interim analysis consisted of three parts. Safety. We had an excellent safety profile. We confirmed our dosing strategy. And importantly, we had an early test of if we have a signal of efficacy. So we didn't test for efficacy, that we will only do in the end. But we saw, we did a so-called futility analysis. So we saw that there were signals. And we saw signals both fatigue and in muscle weakness. Because what's unique with this trial is also that we have two primary endpoints, two alternative primary endpoints. So the regulators have agreed that it's sufficient if we hit one to be successful. So we have two shots on goal. In the Falcon study, so you can also say the Falcon can use both his wings to keep flying. So we have a late stage asset. It's been significantly de risk. It's never been lower risk than now, but it also is a very attractive commercial opportunity. Um, we have about 100,000 patients in Europe, the major markets in Europe and in the US. So it's a rare disease, but it's not ultra rare. Even with conservative estimates of the number of uh, patients that we reach with our compound, and combining that with the pricing that we have validated in payer interviews, it gives us a market opportunity of more than $1 billion. So, um, please join us moving forward as we increase energy to those patients that need us most to increase the light side of the force. Thank you. Thank you for an amazing presentation, Magnus. Thank you, Sonia. And now to the tough questions. Oof. Now, let's see what we have here. How is Abliva positioning itself to remain a leader in your field? If you would, uh, you know, concede that you are a leader. Well, we're definitely uh, the leader in our field. Well, we have positioned ourselves with, with, like, really trying to understand the science, and then also develop a, like, the clinical program to to really 
do something that matters to patients. So we've had a number of competitors, but um, I mean, if we look at the competitive field, we are at the, the top, and there are a few others, but they actually have slightly different angles in this. So we are the leader in this field. So if we are successful, it will be the first drug to reach these patients. Speaking of the patients, how do you uh, incorporate their feedback into your clinical trials? Do you even? De well, definitely. I think that's the key to, to success, to understand the patient need. Not only for the clinical development, but also to have an attractive product once we go to, to market. So we have done, it's both under informal settings. So we have the interview with, with Regina and also other patients. You can access that via our web page. But we've also done f uh, formal interviews to really understand the patient burden. And we have collaborated with um, the largest patient advocacy groups also to interact with them together with the regulators, because it's also important that the regulators understand that this disease. And, and th that work has been published. So that's how we discovered what we really wanted to focus on. And we are pioneers because we were the first company to really target both fatigue and myopathy in this disease. And now we see that actually two of our competitors that are behind us, they've copied our approach. So that's also validation. Would you say that that was the main feedback you got about the fatigue, or what did the patient, uh, patient say? Yeah, well, what, what, what they told us was that, because it's a little bit hard to, uh, to understand. If, if people complain, if somebody says that, I'm tired, people will respond, well, who isn't tired? Maybe they won't say that, but you will feel that. But here you have the part of your uh, body that produces the energy don't produce enough, so it's quite easy to understand how that translates to insufficient energy, but they really felt that they weren't understood. So when we came and said, well, here's a trial that actually focuses on this, but you have told us that is most important to you, here's the trial that focuses on that. And that has generated a lot of positive feedback from the patient community. Finances, what is your financial status? Uh, so the, what, what we did here was to initiate this trial and we did a fundraising about two, two and a half years back and the main milestone there was the interim analysis and now we have successfully passed that and we have uh, communicated that we're now looking at different financing options, so financing or strategic options and we're of course pursuing both of those paths. What is the, oh, I love this formulation, core end goal? Can you have both a core goal and an end <laughs> goal? And in so, uh, if so, what is it for you guys? And what needs to happen for you to reach it? Well, the, the obvious goal here is deliver the first effective treatment for mitochondrial disease patients. But it's, of course, also to create value for the company and its shareholders. But what needs to happen for that to, you know, uh, well, the path forward is really straightforward. I mean, we have designed the program that is needed, and of course, there are a lot of other preparations needed to get to market. But um, yeah, we've come quite far, and, and the path forward is quite straight. Okay, bear with me, because I need to think and read at this at the same time. Uh, does Obliva see an opportunity to expand to other diseases where mitochondrial dysfunction is implicated? Yes and no. Historically, we've had a little bit of broader focus. We believe that a key to success is to be laser focused. So right now, we're not considering other diseases, but I mean, when, I'm saying when, if and when we are successful with this, I'm sure that either we, or somebody inspired by our mechanisms, will expand that to other diseases. It's not our focus now, but of course there are opportunities. Uh, Magnus, as a CMO, what have made you most excited in your company's history so far since you joined the team? Well, we in licensed this compound, and I was already in the beginning super excited because of the mechanism of action. And seeing the compound coming this far and designing a trial that now has been proven to work is, of course, uh, rewarding. But what I'm really waiting for is for that final data readout. Mm. Yeah, we're all expecting it soon. Thank you so much, Magnus Hansson, CMO Abliva. Thank you, Sonia.